conventionally think of as infrastructure in this country. I, you know, I remember when I was at the Miami Herald and I became the editor for growth and development, it was the first time I really had delved in any depth into the thing called infrastructure, which we were under strict orders never to actually use in the newspaper. <laughs> Terrible word. But it turns out to be an absolutely fascinating area of reporting um, and information gathering uh, because it affects everything that we do every day. It affects the kind of, even the kind of society and civilization that we are. And when you look at the, some of the differences between U.S. infrastructure and infrastructure in developing countries, you see um, how, how central that is to the way we live. And um, we're going to hear a very interesting presentation today that will look at some of the vulnerabilities of our current, current infrastructure. To help us with that, we have Brian Palish. He's the Managing Director of Government Relations and Infrastructure Initiatives for the American Society of Civil Engineers. And one of the things that drew me to them was a report that they put out fairly, is it every year, every two years, every four years, uh, sort of a report card on the nation's infrastructure. So we're going to hear more about that today. Thank you so much for being here. And um, take it away. Great. Um, we're trying to get a video, which we could end with it, we could start with it, it doesn't really, we'll, I'll start, and then if they get the video, we can interrupt it, how's that, because yeah. the video is kind of fun. Now, is Brian um, right, is he blocking the screen for any of you? We my big, it, so. it's just as long as it doesn't bounce off my, there we go, that's <laughs> probably better. Um, the vi it's more important to look at that than me, trust me. Um, uh, so thank you all for having us here today and, and to talk about this important topic of infrastructure. It is funny, it is one of those words that when we, I think, started the infrastructure report card and ASC has done this since 1998, I'm pretty sure most folks didn't know that word. Uh, most folks couldn't type it properly. Um, I now can type it pretty quickly. Um, but I think it's really changed uh, in that in that time since 1998, where I think it's a word that folks do use, I think it's a word that that folks uh, the the general public actually understands. Um, so we start and and rather sort of take a couple steps back as we started the process of thinking about our 2013 report card. One of our solutions, if you will, or one of the things that that we think is lacking in the in the society at this point is an actual vision for infrastructure or vision for what we want out of infrastructure. And the reality is infrastructure is just a means to an end at the end of the day. I mean, if we don't have a good road system, that means we can't move goods around, we can't move people around. So so we, we went about the process of putting together a vision statement and sort of focusing on a couple of different points um, one is just this notion that, that infrastructure really is something that connects all of us, whether it's businesses, communities, um, whether it's uh, getting goods to and from somewhere to another place, whether it's moving all of us at the holidays as we're, as we're approaching now or we're in the middle of. Um, the first thing we also looked at is from a short-term perspective. And short-term, we felt very strongly that we actually needed some form of national commitment to rebuilding our infrastructure. There's a lot of history involved in this. You, we all, most of us know the, the stories of Dwight Eisenhower, and he's the one that started the Interstate Highway Program. There's even, we can go further back, uh, you can walk over to the Treasury Department, there's a statue of Albert Gallatin, I think it was Albert, uh, who did the first infrastructure commission back in the early 1800s, um, sort of talking about what the nation's infrastructure should look like. Then it was about canals um, and, and, and goods movement that way. We've changed a little bit since the early 1800s. Um, but in the short term, we need some sort of a commitment to actually a focus on sort of bringing the, the infrastructure that we have to a state of good repair. And then in a more long-term commitment, we need to think about what we want for the future for our nation's infrastructure. Um, so with that sort of vision, um, we sort of then went about the process as we have for the last, uh, was that almost 16 years now, taking a look at infrastructure uh, and grading it in a pretty simple uh, a, a through F grading system. Um, I can certainly explain that as we get into questions. I'm happy to explain how we do that. Uh, Tom, we were. Do you want to do the video now? We'll do it at the end. You want to do it okay. Yeah, then they'll all laugh and they'll have better questions. Okay. How's that? <laughs> That's fine. Um, uh, we'll get the dry, boring stuff over first because um, I cannot do as good as the video. How's that? Not to, not to sell the video too hard. But um, 
when when we're not the first ones to actually do this report card so let me sort of give you that little background again in, in 1988 there was a national commission on public works improvement i think anyone in here has enough gray hair to remember that um, it was done way back in the 1980s it was actually part of some of you might have heard of the water resources bill i think it was a water resources bill of 80 six created this commission so ronald reagan and his administration created this commission to look at infrastructure they produced a report in 1988 we actually as asce decided in 1998 hey you know what no one's really looked at that report for a while like many reports in washington dc it goes on a bookshelf there it sits um uh, interestingly about this one this is a pre-internet report so good luck finding it there's actually a, the executive summary we scanned and put on our website um, but there, it's a, it's a pretty lengthy report. Um, in 1998, we started the process of, of, of doing this again, shall we say, and looking at how, how w whether the infrastructure had improved in that, <clears throat> in that intervening 10 years. Since then, we've, we, we sort of righted the, 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 the timing of it, but we now do it every four years. Our last one was in 2013. Um, we obviously see this as a bit of a public affairs tool not only to, to educate the media and the public, but also to educate legislators. Hence the reason why we do it in that 2013 and 17 time frame. It's the beginning of a uh, presidential uh, uh, term, if you will. That's our logic behind that. A um, couple things that we found, and you can see the grades up there. Um, America's infrastructure uh, in 2013 received an overall grade of a D plus. Nothing to brag about. Um, it is an improvement from the prior uh, prior report card in 2009. That report card graded the nation's infrastructure a D. So there was slight improvement, but it is movement in the right direction. It's the first time, I think, since we've been doing the report card that we'd seen improvement. So that's a, a positive. Um, I would note that we continue to see categories that are, are not uh, not seeing the level of investment or the the attention given to them to actually improve them uh, their day-to-day -day performance is not improving uh, and and it's actually costing the economy money the backlog of projects in almost every category continues to grow um, you know there's an interesting story that that governor Rendell tells about Pennsylvania where he had a big push on bridges and he, I think the number is he put a billion dollars into bridge repair uh, in his first term as governor. And in fact, there were more bridges that were structurally deficient after the billion dollars than before. Um, and part of that is simply the aging infrastructure. That's the, that's the most significant part that you're shaking your head, Laura. Is that because you remember that? Uh, Okay. Oh, Allenton. Okay. Um, and Pennsylvania is the, the state that has the most structurally deficient bridges. Um, probably nothing to brag about, but it is a true fact. Um, but in, in large part, that's because you guys built out your system much earlier than lots of other states, so you have more older bridges. Um, but, but in that sense, we do have this continuing backlog of maintenance and backlog of projects that need to be fixed. When we look at the report card, the things that the, the engineers do, um, is they look at the condition, the capacity, the funding levels, the future need, what the operation and maintenance plans are, not necessarily for a given project, but if a state or, or the nation, if we have that, it, w what the public safety concerns are. Um, what the, what, we, we started now to look at two other things, resilience, which is, a, which is sort of a new word, but it's sort of taking a look at, it's not really a new word, it's a new, I think it's new in the, in the parlance of some of the infrastructure. And then we look also at innovation. Um, and in almost every category, as I said, there's work to be done. Uh, as you can see, the overwhelming majority of the grades, those are Ds. Two of those were near failing. Uh, levees and inland waterways. Um, I think a couple of notes about both those. We'll talk about them later. But uh, in both instances, there's a significant amount of work to be done in both of those areas. Um, the good news is, though, uh, relating back to 2009, is uh, there were a few bright spots if you look between 2009 and 2013. Uh, six sectors improved roads and bridges, solid waste, drinking water, wastewater, and railroads. Um, Communities across the country started working on some of these problems, and I think what we saw is sort of three, three reasons why there were these improvements. One, you actually had state and local governments actually focusing on these things. So in some, some ways, state and local governments figured out a way to start spending some of their own money on these problems, and it's not only 
which is what we've always said. It's not only a federal problem that we have here, it's really a national problem that needs to be dealt with at all levels of government. Um, we saw the private sector getting more involved. If you look at the rail category, uh, you know, the railroads are, it's, they're, they're private. Um, and, and the private sector that owns the railroads decided to spend some money on it, and they've been spending a good amount of money the last number of years. Yes, ma'am. Right. Oh, Where yes. Is that? Or where is it? Oh, I, I saw that. Yeah, I got. I and I. Yeah, I. Th I want to say it's in the Northeast Corridor somewhere, but I don't. Don't okay. quote me on that. I have to go back and look at the piece myself. I think it was um, yeah. What's that? It. I think it is. It, it could be, but there's there's a there's a number of spots in the country where there's actually these movable railroad bridges, which. Sounds crazy, but um, they, they do move to, to allow for ships to go underneath, um, uh, you know, much like we have a Wilson Bridge that's a drawbridge. So that's not like a singularly important place? No, I think, and I, my, my presumption is, uh, no, I haven't watched the piece in a while, so I apologize, but I did watch it, and one of our guys was, was flying in the helicopter, so that he had fun doing that. Um, uh, but I, I think that the notion is, is I, I think the point is, is that that's a important bridge in the sense that there's a lot of traffic on it. It needs to be rebuilt. But, but some of the problems that you have with that, uh, from a, from a, from a commerce, also an engineering standpoint, is you've got this significant thoroughfare that's used frequently. How do you take it out of commission to actually fix it? I mean, so that becomes this sort of, I mean, it's not, it, 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 it gets complicated from an engineering standpoint, how you, how you take something, because you may not be able to fix it that simply. Well, if the Amtrak president, I think, said in it that they were ready to, to do that, to take it out of commission for a little bit, but that they weren't getting any funding. And I, that, that may be. I mean, I, I honestly, I'll admit I don't know enough about the, the particular okay. bridge to give you a good answer on it. Yeah. Um, on your scorecard here, roads and bridges are slightly up. I used to work in Minneapolis for when we had the 2007 bridge collapse. Hmm. Um, so I'm curious where your organization stands on the gas tax, because certainly that, that funding uh, stream has been declining. Um, we've been advocating for a gas tax since probably before I got to ASCE, but certainly in my 15 years there, I've spent a good amount of time advocating for the gas tax. And how much increase. do you think it would have to be raised to deal with the backlog? I will give you the, the so, so we have a position statement, which is not to, you know, but I'm, I'm happy to nuance the discussion, but we have a position statement that says we should raise the gas tax 25 cents a gallon at the federal level. Um, the the answer... Cents over what it is now? Or? Correct. Correct. It's 18.4 cents right now. So um, add 7 cents. Oh, no, add 25 add, cents. Oh, yeah. More than 25 okay. cents. Um, uh, now, that being said, to get us... If we want to get it, it, get other charts up there, yeah, and we get nerdy real fast on this, but that's okay. So, so to make us whole, currently the gas tax is um, hasn't been changed since 1993. Um, it's been 18.4 cents since 1993, um, and to make it whole, and and by whole, what I mean is so that the federal government in the budget that we just passed, um, or MAP 21 that passed a little while before that, they had to fill the highway trust fund with about $15 billion to make, the, 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 to make it whole so they could spend the amount that they wanted to spend on the service transportation bill, which is about $41 billion a year on highways and about nine on transit. So general fund money was taken out and put into the highway trust fund. We would prefer that not to be the case. We would prefer that the Highway Trust Fund fund surface transportation improvements, but that also means you need to find other revenue to go into the Highway Trust Fund. For us, that's the gas tax. We're pretty singular. We're willing to listen to other solutions. We think that's the most, uh, that's the simplest, most um, effective way to do it. Um, admittedly, from a political standpoint, it is not that 
that's not the case. But Do you think you have an opening with the uh, tumbling of oil prices? Uh, yes, absolutely. So and are you going to do we, a renewed push in January when Congress we, we've comes back? Been, we've been renewed. We're, our, our push has been renewed since the spring. I mean, we, we've been... It, we, we've started a new website, which is called fixthetrustfund.org, which gives you basic information about why this should, why this should be the case. Um, we've actually seen bipartisan movement in Congress for this to be the case. Um, you've got Senator Corker from Tennessee. You've got Senator Carper from Delaware. Um, you, uh, you've got others who, are, who have started to talk about the fact that this needs to be fixed. And that's in a bipartisan standpoint, which is, as you know, in Congress at this point, there's not a lot of bipartisanship on, on anything. Um, uh, and, and so I think there is possibly an opening. I mean, the reality is from a true, um, the, the reality is it's a complicated, raising any tax is complicated, right? I mean, and I think this, I would suggest that this probably needs to be part of a larger discussion that no one's just going to go and raise a tax. It doesn't doesn't really, Congress doesn't work that way anymore. Now, historically, if you look back in 19, the dates I will get wrong, but when they put in the first interstate highway program, there was a gas tax, and then they went and they had to double the gas tax, and I want to say it was from two to four cents. I should remember, Jim Overstar used to tell me this story a lot, so I don't, I'm, it's not quite, it's not quite ingrained anymore, but uh, the first two gas tax increases when they were building the interstate highway system were voice votes. We're not doing that anymore, obviously. Although that would be safer, I guess, if it was just a voice vote, then no one would know what happened. So is this um, state by, t uh, by state, the, ta the gas tax, or is it a federal tax? Because I'm seeing here that New Jersey is being pressured to pass Correct. On. There, there are uh, states also have gas taxes, and there's a federal gas tax. So the federal gas tax, which is that 18.4 cents, goes to pay for the federal program, um, and then states have their own. And states, some of them have a percentage, uh, some of, a few have a percentage, like a sales tax on gas. Some of them actually have cents per gallon taxes. That's all across the board. And there are some that are rather low. I think Alaska's is the lowest. I think it's like, it, it, it's ridiculously low, like eight cents. And then I think New York and California have amongst the highest, but that's. So you're advocating for an increase on both fronts, the federal and the states? Um, so, I, I think to fill the, the, the need that we have, which is a slide a little bit later, um, we need to be spending more money on, on service transportation. We also need to spend it better. We need to do some things to, to fix the way we spend it, the way we pick projects, et cetera, et cetera. But at the higher level, the fact that, I mean, I look at it in a more, much more, um, almost a simple fashion. So if you look at the fact that we're trying to spend $1993, that 18.4 cents, which brings in about $30 billion a year, that's the same it's increased a little bit because vehicle miles traveled have increased and there's more people in the country, et cetera. But we haven't changed the rate of taxation, that 18.4 cents since 1993. When I talk to our members or other groups, it's the equivalent of all of us in this room not getting a raise since 1993 and trying to live on our 1993 wages, um, which is a little complicated. Some of you probably were in college, maybe a little bit before that, and maybe mm -hmm. that, you know, that's uh, that probably would not be that. Uh, um, living on your 1993 wage, not so simple, right? Uh, uh, and, 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 and so it has not been adjusted for even for inflation since then. Um, and so I think that makes it a little more complicated. Yes, ma'am. Um, there was a push this summer. You had the director of DOT, you know, making statements at the White House about Correct. how important this is, that they were trying to renew the highway transportation bill. Do you, and then, like, nothing happened. They just... Well, I, would, I mean, I wouldn't say nothing happened because... <laughs> Um, they got something passed. Right, they got something passed, and it and <clears throat> and we didn't bankrupt the trust fund, yeah. and we kept it alive. Right, right. I mean, right. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, it is. It, it, we got the we got the second worst of all options, um, which is we extended the program for through May thirtieth of this year, um, at the same level of funding, um, and so we lived to fight another day about about these issues. Um, our goal at that point was to let it run out this weekend and to be having the fight right now about how we should actually do it. Do um, like, I'm sorry, yeah. do you feel like you kind of missed, or like the idea for overall reform missed its window this summer when you had like, the director of DOT? Oh, he's still, trust me, he's very, he's rather involved. We met, I met with him uh, probably two or three weeks ago. I mean, I think he's, and he spoke on Friday at the 
conference of state legislators meeting. I was not at that. One of my staff was, and he was very vehement about the need to, to solve these problems. And I think, you know, I think the administration's going to continue to be vocal. That's my sense from what, 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 what they've said. Um, I think Congress understands they need to do something. I mean, the reality here is, you know, I, the, the easy way to say it is if this was easy, they'd have already done it. Obviously, it's not easy. Um, you know, anytime you try to raise revenue to solve a problem it is, is not terribly simple anymore, um, even though, you know, what, what, what's the price of gas gone down in the last month? I mean, I, I went away for five days and it dropped nine cents in Alexandria. So, I, don't, I mean, I mean that's, um, that's half of what we need to raise it to sort of make a difference. And to answer your point, Mark, I, didn't, I don't think I answered it clearly enough. So we advocate for eight, 25 cents. Um, to get to whole, you need about 12 cents. So to get to, to, to fill the to fill it to fill the highway trust fund to where to where we need to be level spending is about twelve cents a gallon. Maybe it's eleven, maybe it's thirteen. Um, we would argue, and we've argued with, with members of Congress and others, that if we're gonna go through the process of doing that that raising of the gas tax, which we think is important, we might as well do so in such a way that would benefit the nation, because level funding is not going to benefit the nation, as you'll see in a couple slides, because we're, we're, we have this deficit, the, the roads are not improving, the more, more deficient bridges, so we're not solving that infrastructure gap, that investment gap, so we actually need to raise the level of spending that we have. Now, will we spend all the money we need? Probably not. But we need to take a bite out of that deficit. So I'm pretty bad at math so here. Wait, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you for yeah. a second. The political discussion is fantastic, <laughs> but we're still on the same slide that we started with. I know. So I'm going to ask you to move forward. Okay. And can I'll move the next all slide. These okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, and I'm happy to chat longer. How's that? Um, so, so when we do all of the, when we, so, so we start by. We've got grades, and I think that's an interesting way for us to explain to some people what the problem is. We've all gotten grades in school. Hopefully none of our grades were these bad, um, uh, or this bad, and, 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 and that, that would not be great. Um, uh, and so part of what we also need to talk about when we do this is talk about what it actually means uh, to, to the nation in terms of what we need to be investing. And I, and I would note that this slide, it's a lot of big numbers. Um, and, and the math does get a little bit difficult, but let me, let me just urge a couple things. One is we have the total needs column, which is that left column, which talks about what the total need is in each of the categories. The estimated funding, that is our best estimate, and it is only an estimate. We look sort of back at what historically has been spent um, and what we think might be spent. So if we know that a piece of legislation passed that's going to spend a lot more money or authorize more money or if a state, a couple states have done more, more uh, work on this and they're going to spend more money, we try to capture that in that estimated funding, although admittedly it's only estimated. And then we, we, do, we do simple math, which I actually help do, which means it needs to be simple, um, and that is to figure out what the funding gap is, what that, what that delta is. And, and as you can see, the largest number is under surface transportation, and that counts um, roads, bridges, and transit. Um, it is a it is a large number, and it is the 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 amount that we're you know we have the biggest gap in. Um, I would note that the yearly investment needed, um, which is maybe a little bit more uh, easier a number to stomach, um, the the delta that we have or the the investment gap is two hundred billion dollars a year, which is a lot of money. But it is seems somehow more manageable uh, than than 3.6 trillion or even the 1.6 trillion of, of additional needed funding. It is a great deal of money. We don't presume that that's going to come from the federal government. Our presumption is is that's going to come from all levels of government, and even the private sector. We talked about rail as being one where where the private sector is heavily involved. There's a few other categories where the private sector is involved. Electricity is one where the private sector is significantly involved. Obviously, I mean, we all pay for electricity, but the private sector is the one that does those investments. So, so that gives you a little bit of sense on, on the investment needed. Um, going through the, some, of the, some of the categories, um, ports was a new category for us this year uh, in, in the report card, and, and we think it's an increasingly important um, uh, uh, category for the nation. 
goods movement is terribly important. I will say that this next transportation bill, from a policy standpoint, I think you'll see a significant amount of effort being placed on freight and a freight <laughs> program and this idea of goods movement. It is one thing that I think folks are starting to understand that we do need to have the proper ability to move goods around the country, um, and, and some of our ports are lacking in that. When you uh, talk about improvement, you, are you including like security improvements? Or are you talking from a purely functional standpoint? Um, generally speaking, we're looking at primarily a, an, a, a uh, infrastructure standpoint. Although, admittedly, when you're the rub when you talk about security is we, we think of from, from an engineering standpoint, we look at that as being the, this notion of resilience. And so security does get included in that. It's, 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 it's not just guns and gates and guards. It's a little bit more than that. Um, and, and so I think we would look at it a little bit more broadly. Um, and, and, and there is a little bit more to it than that. So it's, but from a grading standpoint, we're looking mostly at the infrastructure and, and our grade for ports is primarily based on the connection sort of at the gate of the port. So in your local area, how, 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 how stuff gets out and then how stuff comes in. That's where the most data is. Most ports don't want to share their information about the, 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 um, how their infrastructure is inside. Um, uh, you can see the statistic up there, 95% 90, of overseas trade moves through our ports, our nation's ports. That makes complete sense, obviously. Um, some of the problems that we have in the ports uh, is, the, is the fact that some of those land side connections are um, old and not, um, not well done and, and are very congested. Those of you who have been in the Los Angeles area, if you've ever been near the Port of LA or the Port of Long Beach, um, it's, it's a night, it's, it's, um, congestion is not the right word. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, and, and the amount of freight that comes through there and then tries to get out on the 710 freeway is a little bit crazy. Um, Are all ports completely government run or do they have some sort of private public partnership? Um, it would depend on the port. I mean, it, it, and they're all over the place. Some ports are run by private entities. But you know the the, the the local government retains some sort of an interest. I think I think everyone's going to be different. Um, uh, uh, so so ports, as you can see, got a grade of C. Inland waterways got a grade of D minus. Um, you know this is one of our oldest infrastructure categories. If you think about it, locks and dams and canals and the way we move goods that way. Um, one one of the uh, one of the issues here is uh, this idea of service interruptions. Um, when, when a lock can't move goods, those ships just back up behind it, the barges back up behind it. That costs a great deal of money. Um, the, the, there are a couple of estimates at the current rate of spending, although that's changing a little bit. The current rate of spending, uh, with, when you look at the backlog of major projects, the Corps of Engineers has put a schedule out that shows the, the, ma the current major projects won't get completed until the year 2090. Uh, none of us will be there for the ribbon cutting for that, probably. Um, and, and so, and so we, we've got some issues. Uh, there's a tax that had not been raised for a long time, actually, somehow, in some, by some uh, work that was done, the inland waterway user fee, which is a tax on diesel fuel that goes into barges that run up and down these rivers. Um, that was increased by nine cents in the, I think it was in the defense authorization bill. It got very confusing, but it, it got increased this last week. Um, so a, a minor victory um, and, and a step in the right direction. Uh, but you also have these locks, some of which are, I mean, they're all, a majority of them are past their useful life. And the useful life is usually 50 years, but a lot of them are pushing 75 years. Lori, you're from, I mean, the, pen, the, the locks through Pittsburgh, I mean, they're all very, very old. And if those things fail, then the river stops, basically. And it gets, you can't move any goods in and out. So it's, it becomes very problematic at best. Um, roads, as you can see, um, is a grade of a D. Uh, you know, 42% of our roads remain congested. The, in, in addition to that, we've got a significant amount of roads that are in poor or mediocre condition. Um, meaning that the pavement is just not in good condition, which actually adds cost to you and I because we go through a pothole, we pop our tire, we break our axle, we get to go fix that. Um, 
you turn that 42 percent you turn it into what what go what we're wasting in gasoline and you're looking at about a hundred billion dollars of of wasted fuel every year um which is certainly less than what we would what it would be if we could raise the gas tax and move move people more efficiently and then they'd be stuck in less traffic etc cetera, etc cetera. so brian can i just clarify something you said you you said to that your organization recommends raising at 25 cents right mm -hmm. that you equate to 30 billion dollars a year more right no that no the 25 the 25 cents would be i have to um 25 cents would be it's about a billion four per every penny so i'm not going to do the math because that's scary so for it's about 30 billion right it's closer to 40 billion i think uh, but okay, okay, so let's say it's yeah. thirty-five billion. Yeah. Um, does that mean that you feel as though there's what seventy or eighty billion a year needed? Because if you're raising it, I mean, I th I think the numbers of needed, and I'd have to go. There was a report that came out. Ashto released a report last week, and I I have not cracked it other than to look at the press release. So I apologize, but I want to say that the the level of spending. That needs to occur at the capital on capital projects from all levels of government should be a little over a hundred billion dollars a year, and we're not quite there yet. I mean, you know, we, we got a couple problems with our with our road and bridge system, uh, and that's on roads and bridges, right? So that's is that that we have an aging system. We built this system out starting in the 50s, if not before that, for some of it. I mean, the Pennsylvania Turnpike's older than than the interstate system. Um, and we have not kept up with the operations and maintenance of it, if you will. We haven't done all, the, all of the proper O&M. And in some ways, we need to expand the system a little bit, because where we can, we're to, to, to get rid of some of the congestion. And so we're, we're trying to do two things at once, and we're not, and we're having to rebuild stuff. We're not, we're, we're past the point in some of these areas, and it gets a little bit uh, 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 engineering nerdy, but we're past the point in some of these areas where rehabilitation works, and we actually have to go to rebuilding, um, and w which is more which is more costly and more time consuming. And so that's, you know, one of the things we've been urging is we need to do a better job on our O and M, so that you you know if you do good O and M up front. Um, then you don't have to do the rebuilding as, as frequently. And that's one of the things we've urged. So bridges, um, a couple points on bridges, and, and uh, is that in the nation, one in nine is structurally deficient. Um, 200 million trips are taken daily across structurally deficient bridges. And, and I guess I'd make the engineering caveat right now. Just because your bridge is structurally deficient does not mean it's going to fall down. It means there's a number of problems with it, and it doesn't rate high enough. Um, in, in its what they call sufficiency rating. But it's a bridge that you need to watch. Um, the good news is we have a pretty robust bridge inspection program in the country. Every bridge is supposed to be inspected every two years. Some bridges, as they, as they age more, actually get inspected more frequently than every two years. If your bridge has significant problems and you, you don't have a way to fix it, then you, you might inspect it every month um, for, for that purpose. The other things that engineers do, and I think it, it's important to note, is they, if the bridge does have problems, they'll weight restrict it so they don't let heavy trucks or heavier vehicles on the bridge so that, that doesn't cause it problems. They will, if, if they need to, they will close the bridge. Um, and that's probably the, the, the worst option that they have, but they will do that if they feel like there's an actual safety issue. Yes, Yeah, I don't. But there is it, it, somewhere in the somewhere in the accounts of that bridge there are. And it, it was it was quite some time, and they were working on that. Um, and and that's you know it. it I, I will say it's one of those things where I think that um, uh, w with regards to any of these things, I mean, I think that there. Um, I guess I would say this about bridges. Bridges are probably one of the the areas where engineers spend the most time. I think in in the sense of. And they take that job very seriously. I mean, I think we've seen instances in addition to uh, later than that. And there was there was a there was uh, in downtown Philadelphia. A gentleman was at lunch. He looked up. He saw this bridge on 95 that looked like it had something funky going on. He made a few phone calls. They closed 95, and it was closed for three or four days while they replay while they repaired the 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 problem with the bridge. So, I mean, I do think there are. Examples out there where where folks are monitoring these things, and even you know just by you know the, I think the 
Governor Rendell talked about that in the uh, in the piece in 60 Minutes. But that was not a that's not a news story. That's a that that's that's been out there for a while. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, here. sorry, where a young woman was driving across the Bay Bridge and was rear-ended and was pushed over the, basically the um, railing broke and her car went into the water. How, that's not really like a structural problem that one could see with the naked eye like you're talking about right. when calling in. What happens in those cases to the things that maybe people aren't looking out for um, and then well, I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about that instance, but I, there's certainly, um, <clears throat> there are, there are standards by which bridges are designed, like any, and, and so, uh, you know, not knowing enough about that instance, I'm not going to, I, I just mean like problems that <coughs> maybe people aren't seeing the same way that one might look at a bridge and think something looks off. There's something called like, bridge can be something called functionally obsolete. Like the two categories is something that sadly know way too much about. Um, one, one, right. is something structurally deficient, but then if you look at the Department of Transportation and the inspectors also will categorize the bridge as something called functionally obsolete. That's probably what your bridge was. Okay. Could be. It's just yeah. an older bridge that's not up to like modern standards. Of good and, and what functionally obsolete generally relates to, because yeah, now we're all engineers. I, I, it's the, <laughs> and it's funny, we go back and forth. Well, it's, um, so, so structure deficient means that there is some form of a deficiency that's been seen. Now, it might be something that's, that, that is not a safety issue, but it still gets categorized in such a way, and it's something that you need to watch. Functionally obsolete generally pertains to uh, lane widths are not the right size. The on-ramp, off-ramps don't conform to standards of today. I'll give you a couple of great examples of two functionally obsolete bridges that everyone knows about. Uh, there's this bridge called the Brooklyn Bridge, okay, functionally obsolete. Um, pretty sure we're not going to tear that one down and redo it to make it not functionally obsolete. I don't think anyone would vote for that, okay, um, or, or urge us to do that. I'm pretty sure the 14th Street Bridge, although I, I have not looked at its report, I'm thinking it might be functionally obsolete. Um, uh, the old Wilson Bridge was functionally obsolete. Obviously, the new one is not. Um, so I think in some ways, you know, there are some historic bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge we're probably not going to address. I mean, where you can, you might. Um, if there's guardrails that need to be raised, fine. We'll, they'll, they'll probably do things like that. So I think that that's, you know, I, it's an interesting. Is that just because they were built before standards were changed? Or, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, it, these, these kinds of standards evolve, right? I mean, we have... We know more about bridges than when Emily Roebling and her husband, John Roebling, built the Brooklyn Bridge, right? So we, we do know, and I don't think that bridge was ever meant to have cars, right? It was built in the 1860s, so they didn't have, I mean, so it was a different, a different time. Um, uh, and, and so a different, uh, so, so I think there's some of that. And I think even bridges that were built in the 50s, we have a different standard today than we, than we do today. And it's evolving partly due to safety issues, partly due to materials design, partly, you know, speed. There's all sorts of reasons you do that, that those things have changed. I'm probably not the best person to ask that question to as a non-engineer, but I'm sure that we could get an answer. Is there a term, like, you know, functionally obsolete, or like at what point does a bridge become so bad or deteriorated or, or uh, dated or whatever that you, it would warrant like shutting it down and saying you, nobody can drive over this. Um, that that becomes the that becomes uh, within the structurally deficient category, and there are bridges that are shut down. There are bridges that are weight restricted. Um, usually, localities want to deal with that stuff beforehand, and they usually do. I mean, there's I mean I, I, I'm not saying usually, but they, that the, the goal is to not have those bridges shut down. Obviously, there are times when you know something may happen, and you, you need to do, you know, you need to take a drastic action. There was a bridge between Vermont and New York. I can't remember the name of the bridge now. It got shut down. It was the only, that was the only way to get between this, between Vermont and New York up by Lake Champlain. That was it. And, and so they, there was a pretty aggressive program put into place and they rebuilt the bridge in a very quick fashion. Um, and they were already in the process of planning it, I think. But then, you know, when you shut the bridge down, and you have a community on one side and the businesses on the other, 
you figure out a way to, to do that a little bit more quickly. And we think that's one of our success stories in the report card is, is, is that is the, the, what they did to, to solve that problem. As you mentioned in the past, you know, going back to when the interstate system was built, there was bipartisan support for infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. Today, there clearly is not. There's a major divide, whether it's on the gas tax, for example, and Republicans and Democrats have completely different views as to what it is we should do with that. Um, even though this affects all of us, and even though President Obama has pointed out that infrastructure investment would create lots and lots of jobs, that hasn't you know, he hasn't been able to sell that. What do you think has changed sort of culturally in the last 50 years beyond sort of hyper-partisanship now that has made us as a country less willing to invest in infrastructure or look at it as a priority? Um, I would, well, I guess I would question a little bit that there's, that there's not partisan agreement that we need to solve the problem. So I think there is some bipartisan agreement that we need to solve the problem. I don't think there's probably enough. So I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, I, uh, but I, I don't want I don't want anyone to be left with a thought that there's not bipartisanship r relating to these issues because I do think that you know Barbara Boxer and Jim Inhofe agree that we need to fix the Highway Trust Fund. Um, now they're probably not going to exactly agree on exactly what the solution might be, but they at least agree that we need to fix the problem. Um, likewise, I think you know Bill Schuster and yeah, but if and, the Republicans have, have suggested raising you know the gas tax five cents or ten cents and that's not going to solve the problem from your standpoint because you correct want, you know, so they both fine maybe they all agree that we have to spend something on it but you know the, I mean the I, I guess I, I guess I think I, I think a frustration and this is probably this is my opinion it's prob it's not ASC so I, I I know I'm on the record so I hesitate with my opinion sometimes um, um, I, I, I do think we have a situation um, in in the country where a lot of people don't people don't want to pay for anything I mean, and I, I, I know that's a very simple and sort of a base answer to your question, but, you know, we've seen polling that's been done relating to the gas tax where you give, you lay out the problem and there's no disagreement that there's a problem. No one's going to disagree, okay? Oddly. I mean, they're probably a little bit disagreeing, but it's a, a, a super majority of agreement that we have an infrastructure problem. And then when you start going down a list of things that we could do to solve the problem, and all of them relate to paying more money for something because none of this is free, right? There's almost no agreement. So, you know, I want my roads fixed, but I don't want to pay for it. You know, I don't want any more water main breaks, but don't raise my water rates. I mean, most people, I, I would say everyone in this room pays less for their water rate than they do for their cell phone or their cable bill. Guaranteed. And we may, with, with some exceptions. If you're one of those people that doesn't watch TV ever and doesn't have cable, okay, fine. But the majority of people in this country pay more for their cell phone than they do for water. And frankly, they probably pay more for their cell phone than they do for the gas tax every month. I mean, the, the, the stuff that we're talking about raising the gas tax, if you raised it that 18, we'll say 18 cents for so double it, it's going to be about $110 a year for the average driver. That's two bucks a week, three bucks. I mean, you know, that. I, so, okay, granted, if you're driving the Expedition, it's different. If you're driving a Prius, it's different, but the average. So I think that's, it. it, it but, but if you take a poll of the American people, do they want any of their taxes raised for anything? No. But do they want any of their services cut? No, they don't want that either. So it's, you know, I, which is why we see one of the solutions to this problem is simply leadership as, as sort of simple as that may sound. It's having a series of people stand up in a bipartisan fashion and say, you know what, it's time to lead on this, and this is what this is what we're going to do. This is what's best for the country. It's going to it's going to be what makes the economy move forward, not just to create those construction jobs, which is important. But I'll get to another slide, and I got to keep I'm moving. And take a little bit of leadership here, and just remind us we've got half an hour and right. a lot of slides to get through. Right, and I, and I'll and I'll go quick. So so uh, rail. Um, uh, here, I'll get that. We don't want to reboot now. <laughs> um, uh, so, as I said in the in the beginning, there's a lot of work that's been done in the rail sector. A lot of money has been spent. Um, it's a category where folks are spending money. Um, it's private money. It it does demonstrate that where there's private money, there there can be some benefits to these things. Oh, man. I think you have to click back onto the PowerPoint on the computer. Sorry, I um, I took the focus off you. That's okay. Um, 
drinking water, which we were just talking about, uh, there are 240,000 water main breaks every year. Not all of them are as uh, uh, news catching as the one in Los Angeles that flooded Poly Pavilion. UCLA's basketball court, not all of them can be that interesting, or the one up here on River Road that, you know, we had to do uh, water rescues with the, uh, you know, the white water rescue team or whatever. I mean, um, but, but, but there are, you know, when you, when you do the, the math that I did, it's about 650 a day. Um, one of the dilemmas in that is not only is it disruptive and it, it costs people money, people might have to boil their water, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, it is, it, it is very disruptive to, to, to a local business if you have to shut the water down. But in addition to that, when that water main breaks and we're, we're losing clean potable water, we've already spent the money as a, as a local government to clean that water. So that money's just that water's just just leaving, uh, if you will. Um, uh, lots of pipes are, are 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 relatively old. We have an older system, and depending on what kind of city you live in, if you live in an old city, the pipes are simply older. Um, this is likewise the case in with wastewater. Um, Seventy-five percent of the needs for 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 the wastewater system is is really pipe and capital repair uh, type stuff. Yes. Where's the data come from? Um, that is data that comes from the American Water Works Association, I believe. And I think, the and I think that's just an estimate. I mean, has the, a list of the resources it does. They use to compile the and, and if you go onto our website, each of these each of these categories has a pretty detailed, um, uh, as you can imagine, from a bunch of engineers. It's got a pretty detailed list of of of, uh, of <clears throat> sources. Um, uh, with with all these things, I mean, you know, a couple of the takeaways: um, the wastewater treatment systems are aging. Um, a lot of the a lot of the larger ones were put into place after the Clean Water Act in the early 70s. Um, you know, I still think there are some uh, some some interesting notes. I mean, Georgetown, there's still some wooden sewers in Georgetown. Um, uh, you know, and I don't know, and I don't know. I mean, because we all know where that is, right? I mean, I, it, it, fun fact. Um, and I think it's an interesting. I, I think it's an interesting. Uh, it's a juxtaposition because, uh, and, and there's actually some, some engineers did such a good job when they put those in, in the late 1800s, that they've lasted for that long, right? So yay to the engineers, but wow, we haven't gone back and thought about that for a hundred and some odd years. I mean, okay. I mean, it's, it's an interesting, and I guess at some level, eh, maybe you don't need to fix it if it's not broken, but it is this notion that we can't just, you know, w one of the problems that we find with wastewater and drinking water is we only think it's a problem when it's a problem for us, right? If it, you turn on the water every morning, it's fine, right? We don't have, I mean, you know, as a nation, it's pretty impressive. We have a lot of clean water in this nation. We do not have the, the, the amount of waterborne disease that many, many other nations have. Um, so the reality is our system works pretty darn well. Um, but... With 240,000 water main breaks every year, or every year, uh, it could work probably a little bit better. You're never going to get to zero, just like you're never going to get to zero deficient bridges. But 240,000, that might be too many. It's probably, we'd probably agree that that's too many. Can I just say anecdotally, a couple months ago, we had a gusher outside my little townhouse. The pipe had broken, and literally the water was, was gushing out in a waterfall like this. And the power company, the water company was called first thing in the morning. And, and I actually called repeatedly, and I was told, we're aware of it. We have so many breaks today. It was one of those sudden cold days. We just can't get to it. And it literally took them 10 hours. And the water was just being pouring out for 10 hours before they could get there because so many pipes broke just because it got cold. So there's, it's been written about, but I think there are more stories to be done just locally. Just really quickly. George Hawkins, general manager of DC Water, is a great interview. He's <laughs> awesome, right? He is. He will sit down with you and talk with you, and he's real. He I, is. I find he's real, and so if you ever want to report on this, talk to me. I know that on wastewater, he's 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 awesome. He does a good he, job. Yeah, he's a peach. Yeah, and he's um and he's done a lot of. I mean, he he's interesting in what he's done in DC, and that he's really changed the way. DC Water, which is the Wastewater Authority, has really been dealing with things. They've got a multi-billion dollar program. He's actually tried to make it a little greener so he can spend a little bit less money. They're actually doing something um, 
to start this month, next month. Yeah, they're they're turning the they're turning the biosolids, which I'll let you guys you can figure out what that is um, from the wastewater treatment plant, um, and they're going to turn that into energy, um, and they're going to utilize that to to run part of their operations at the wastewater treatment plant. And interestingly, you know, getting to the energy section, um, when we have those disruptions. And, you know, it seems like if you're in this area, we've got lots of power disruptions. It's rather frustrating for some reason. I live in northern Virginia and Alexandria. It seems like when we have a bad storm of any kind, the power's out. Um, it, it costs businesses a lot of money. It costs all of us a lot of money if you need to replace the contents of your refrigerator frequently. But I think the other thing that's interesting about when the power goes out, and I think it's one of those things when you sort of link all these things together and talk about the interdependency, um, you know, the energy grid is related to wastewater and drinking water because when the power goes down, the wastewater system stops working, as does the drinking water system, meaning those places can't be powered, not to mention the traffic lights and the transit systems and all of that. Um, some of the things we've found in, in relating to this notion of resiliency and how it's all interdependent, when you look at what happened in Hurricane Sandy, a lot of people actually, as, as, as terrible a storm as that was, they went out in advance and tried to prepare for it. Folks bought generators. They tried to, you know, do what they could to prepare, even inland. Um, and, and some of the sort of anecdotal stories we heard, um, folks uh, were without power for a week, 10 days, uh, which is complicated. But they had generators, which you think, okay, well, they were fine, right? You just hook up a generator. Well, when the power is out for a week, that means the gas stations don't work. No one bought gas for a week's worth of generator, right? So you had to go to the gas, there's no gas station, gas stations don't pump when there's no, I mean, so there's this whole, you know, connectedness of all these things that we sometimes forget about. Um, one of the things that we did, uh, and to bring this to, to a bit of a more economic standpoint, one of the things that we did after the 2009 report card and before the 2013 was to actually spend a little bit of time on what the economics of all this were. Uh, which seems weird maybe for engineers to do that. Um, but we kept getting the question from members of Congress, their staff, and frankly from you guys in the media, so what's it matter? You guys keep giving us these grades of D. No one does anything. We just limp along. Um, what does it matter? Does it even matter? Um, and uh, maybe, that's not the, maybe that's not exactly the way it was put, but that's the way I, I took, the, uh, took, took the discussion. And, and the notion being, is there really an effect if we don't, is, is there an effect on the nation if we don't make these investments? I think the notional idea being that we'll just limp along if we don't do anything. And so what we took a look at is um, uh, with an with economics consulting firm, because this is not certainly not stuff that, that, that we, uh, we could model or understand, to take a look at longer term between, at that point it was 2011, 2012, and the year 2020 and 2040, what happens if we have basically flat funding? Because that was, the, that was our economic presumption, because we had to make one. Um, and, and what we found is, um, if we don't start investing more, there were sort of three, th three touch points that, that we found. One is that the GDP would, would not grow by 3.1 trillion, so we would lose the growth of GDP, uh, the potential growth in GDP of 3.1 trillion, which is a lot. Um, uh, that, in fact, we would actually lose in the year 2020 three and a half million jobs. And that's across all sectors. That's not construction jobs, that's all sectors. Um, an area where jobs grow oddly, or maybe not oddly, is in things like auto repair because um, we're driving through more potholes. Um, and then, last but not least, that middle number is, while you and I wouldn't necessarily lose our jobs, per se, um, and we wouldn't necessarily lose income, our disposable income would be hurt in the sense that we would all be having to spend money on things we don't necessarily want to spend money on, like wasted gasoline and traffic, the pothole that you run over and you got to fix your car, the electrical blackout that happens that makes you need to uh, replace whatever in your house. Um, uh, you know, it might be your food, it might be uh, other, other things that, that, that go on in that. So what we found is if, if we don't start making these investments, it actually is hurting 
the national economy, and in some places, probably more locally, it's hurting it even more. Um, we did it on a national basis, and these are numbers that look at the year 2020. I did not, I did not, we didn't put the ones in there for 2040. So as I said earlier, there's a few things that we think as key solutions. We talked about this idea of leadership. Um, we talk, the, the other thing we've been focused on a great deal is if we're going to make these levels of investment, we need to do so in a more sustainable fashion, in a more resilient fashion. I think you've seen some of that in, in New Jersey as they've used some of the, 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 the money from the Sandy Relief to build things a little bit stronger, more robustly, so that they can, they can weather a, a large storm again. Um, and, and, and think about it in that way. And then, last but not least, we actually do need to fund this stuff because level funding is not going to help us. But if we're going to do that, we need to prioritize and plan it appropriately um, and, and start prioritizing some of these projects. You know, we need, to, we need to fix the most efficient bridges or the ones, the structurally deficient bridges that have the most traffic going over them, right? Because that's, you know, those are the ones that are most, uh, the, the ones that will have a, a larger effect. Um, so one of our jobs as ASC, I think, is to make this infrastructure issue more visible. I think we've kind of done that. I mean, so I, I can't stop every once in a while and pat ourselves on the back a little bit and say that we've helped. You guys have helped in the media. I think it's, it's um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's something that the American people do need to know about. They, you know, they, they frequently don't know about it unless it really affects them directly that day, like the water doesn't turn on or there's a gusher outside your door when you open the door. Um, we feel that the report card's a pretty easy way for us to do that, um, and, it, and it, it brings it across to, to, to folks pretty well. Um, talk a little bit about the Highway Trust Fund. We talked a lot about that, so I'm going to skip these two slides. We can talk more about that. Some of what we've done, though, is focus on this idea uh, on a more basic level for folks to, that, that why we need to fix a trust fund, what, what the trust fund does. So I'll put that slide up there. You guys can go to that website and take a look at it. A couple of um, things worth noting. Uh, I do think we still have a problem with infrastructure lacking that national vision. Uh, you know, I think when Dwight Eisenhower said we're going to build an interstate highway system, people thought about that and they, they knew what he meant, and, and then we went forward and did that, much like the space program with President Kennedy. There have been other, uh, you know, I think in the 70s, the early 70s, you had the Cuyahoga River was on fire. I think everyone could say, oh, we need to, we need to have clean water, and so we, we have that now. Um, we're sort of lacking a vision that, that, that gets us to that point at this point. Um, it, our infrastructure spending in the nation is decreasing relative to other nations. And sometimes that's an interesting point. Sometimes it's not for folks. Um, but I think it's a, it's a valid one. Um, I don't think we, you know, w we've got a lot of infrastructure built out. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't need to <clears throat> maintain it and make sure that it operates properly. And I think that's one of the issues that, that we're facing. Yes, ma'am. Do, do you rank the U.S. infrastructure against... Uh, other developed nations? We don't. We do not. The World Economic Forum has done that, and they've got a report that they put out, um, and you know, they have a series of factors that they that they that they run through. I think we're about we're 14th in in the world. Um, you know, I would say some of those comparisons are are complicated and difficult. We certainly have. I, I would say you know, of the developed nations. We have probably more infrastructure than most people. I don't, you know, I don't know how you, I don't know how you get your arms around that. But certainly, we have seven, almost seven hundred thousand bridges. I'm sure that, you know, maybe not even in the EU they have seven hundred thousand bridges. I don't know. I don't know what their bridge inventory is. So I think we have, we have a bit of a problem in the fact that we have so much infrastructure and we're a pretty large country. Um, so it is, it is, and you know, so that's. Mentioned like a two hundred fifty billion dollar gap, I guess, in one of your earlier slides. But that was for all of government, right? Two hundred billion, yes. Two hundred billion, yeah. yeah. So how do you imagine that gap being filled? Is it, I guess, what's the split between federal and state, and local? Like, is it a you know, seventy thirty split here? Or um, I, I, it's going to depend on the category, and I don't hate to answer the question that way. Um, you know, in the wastewater drinking water category, that's primarily local spending. Um, and so that's that that gap's going to have to be probably picked up by 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 state and local governments. Um, there's a bit of a role for the federal government there. I think in surface transportation, it's generally been a 55-45 split. 
and and I would think that that would probably continue. Forty five percent being the 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 the, the feds, uh, depend on you know what kind of spending, but basically, so I think it's it, it's going to matter in each category, and then I do think there's this increasing role for the private sector, although that money, you know, we all need to remember that money's not free. Um, you know, the, the, that there, there's a not that there's a that's a negative, but but it is you know when someone says oh the solution is just P threes public private pu public private sector or you know private investment, well, private sector comes to and they want to go build a project they expect a rate of return right I mean that's admittedly there's no harm in that but that's so, cool. so we had a lot of questions for you about the road and bridges category yeah. of the gas tax what other aspects or suggestions would you have for DC based reporters to be getting into some of those other areas like like wastewater or or um, some of the other angles that you're talking about that may be less straightforward than hey readers this bridge that's near you is really deficient right well I mean I think I think there's a lot of I mean it depends on it depends on where you know, it, from a national basis, I think, you know, you guys are primarily going to focus on national policy issues, right? So probably in the next year, I mean, there, there's two areas probably in the next year where there's, where there's a good amount of sort of national focus. One is going to be on the surface transportation. That ends on May 30th. The other area that, that's going to be a pretty big focus, I think, is aviation. Uh, that, that piece of legislation that funds the FAA and authorizes the FAA ends on September 30th. So there's going to be a good amount of discussion on that, and and uh, that's not, you know, unlike surface transportation, which seems to be primarily focused on the infrastructure part of it. Aviation is a little bit broader than that, but there's things like next gen, which is computer infrastructure, right, to make planes fly better and 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 make the make the air transport system the the, the make the airspace more efficient. Um, there, there's a lot of work that's going to be done on that, but there's, I think that that's something to probably watch a little bit and, and, and be interested to, uh, in, in looking at. Um, so you said about a half dozen categories that you rate the group from 09 to 13. Correct. Um, do you, uh, and I'm, I just figured out, do you think the, the stimulus had anything to do with that? Because I know it's one time money, but. Um, I think what, what, what we found is in roads and bridges, and in wastewater and drinking water, the stimulus had an effect. Um, it, it certainly had an effect in roads on the pavement condition, because a lot of the money was spent on, on simple pavement improvement, which is good and needed to happen, so that's good. Wastewater and drinking water, they got about, I might get my numbers wrong, so if you want to write the number you left, you should give me a call and I'll get you the exact number. I think they put $6 billion into the state revolving loan funds, which generally those have been getting about a, a billion and a billion and a half uh, depending on the uh, the appropriations bills um, and so having that amount more of money to go in there was a significant bump that stuff is pretty well I will say in wastewater and drinking water with the state revolving loan funds those things are relatively well um, prioritized each state's got a priority list and so you could pick the, the the best projects to go and they were ready to roll so that 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 made it more efficient uh, I have a couple questions one in terms of, you know, how do we not just, like, make this a money pit situation, right? Like, we're just keeping an old house together kind of thing. Like, what other nations have approached this in a different way that's proven to be more successful? Like, is there a different sort of collective approach to the way we think about infrastructure? Um, and then second, how much do you guys think about advocating, like, multimodal projects? Like, if you're going to replace a bridge, making sure that it integrates, you know, pedestrian and bike and transit and all that type of stuff. Um, we do a lot of that, so we, we certainly support this notion. I mean, I think some of the um, some of this whole idea, if you go back a couple of slides where I said prioritize, plan, and fund, I think the prioritizing and planning is the part where you start to have the discussions about, it, it may be less about, oh, let's go replace a bridge, and, and you may need to do that, but what problem are we trying to solve, right? And, and maybe a bridge is a bad example, but if you, if you look at... Um, a, a lot of discussions in this area have been focused around, you know, what type of transit solutions appropriate. And obviously, we have now the Silver Line. There was discussions when we started discussing the Silver Line. Maybe it should just be bus rapid transit out to Dulles Airport. You've got that road in the middle, right? The the the, the, the airport road again, the, and the access road. And so, you know, so so it, it's really I think about ha taking a step back and not coming with a predetermined solution to the problem. 
I think engineers are, are pretty well suited to have that, those, some of those discussions. Um, and, and so it is taking a little bit broader view about what, what problem are we trying to solve. It's not always that easy. Um, and it's hard to, from a federal policy standpoint, it's hard to, um, I, I think it's complicated to, to legislate that. Um, I think that's probably local people getting together and saying, hey, we need to solve, well, what problem are we trying to solve and what's the best way to solve it? Um, but it is a, probably a little bit hard for Congress to say that sometimes. I think they, and I'm not sure folks really like it if that if Congress would say that. I'm not, you know, as, as an example. And is there a nation that like approaches this better than we do? I, I think probably in every. I think probably in every. I think what we're trying to find, and I'll, I'll sort of answer your question, is um, I think what we'd like to see is. Um, where folks have, have done successful uh, solutions, whatever those might be, is that folks take a look at those. So maybe it might be in a different country. I think if you look, I'll give you an example, if you look towards Australia, okay, um, and I'll, that's a big, that's a continent and a country, um, and I'm, I'll, I won't get more specific than Australia, but Australia deals with water issues all the time, right? They don't have enough water, they have lots of drought issues, they are a water, you know, they're, they're short on water, shall we say. They have a lot of different things that they've done to stretch water. It, it, that's probably not a good technical term, but if that makes sense. <laughs> but, 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 but basically, whether it comes down to gray water, water reuse, desalination, they've got a series of things that they have done to really do a better job of dealing with their water issues. And I think, and I know, I think, California has looked at some of that, and so I think that we need, we're in that, that's an instance where we need to look elsewhere um, to, to maybe find some better solutions. Um, how long is the video? Like three minutes, three minutes. yeah. Um, um, well, you've got eight left. Um, I don't think I, I, let's see if I have any more slides. Um, right, and I would say this, financing, let me, let me end with one point here. Uh, and we talked about state and local governments having a role, um, and, and they do, and they certainly should have a role, and they need to have a, a larger role in many ways. Um, financing cannot replace funding, so it goes to my P3 point. The reality is we've even heard some folks in, in sort of the Wall Street community say when we've, because they come and talk to us about these issues just like you do, and the issue becomes, well, you know, what they're starting to realize is all of this capital that they have, unless people start spending, unless there's more money, more funding available, they can't finance, you know, the, some of these projects can't be financed. Um, here are some of the resources. USDOT has got a number of good resources, whether it's their condition and performance report. They're the ones that have the bridge inventory. It's not our inventory. Uh, they, they have the inventory. Uh, there's a Bureau of Transportation Statistics, if you want to get real uh, numbers focused and nerdy about that stuff. Uh, the EPA does a drinking water and wastewater needs survey. Um, they're really slow about it, but it does come out. Um, uh, the dam safety officials, if you want to know about more about dams or levees, are, are a good group of folks to talk to about that. There is now a national levy database. One of the things that, that one of the things we've urged for a long time, uh, starting in uh, 2006, 2007, was maybe we should know where all the levees are. We did not know where they were uh, post-Katrina. How about that? Um, and we do now. We have a better sense. We have 30,000 miles of them mapped. Uh, and TRIP stands for the Road Information Project. If you want more state-specific information, so if you're writing a state-specific piece, they're, they're a good source on roads and bridge information if you can't get that stuff from us. And then those of you that have tablets, um, all of this could be put on your tablet as a source of information. We have an app. It just got re-released last week. We added some new state data, so it's pretty, the state data is refreshed. No new grades, but refreshed state data. So just to be, to play the commercial for our app. Everyone's got to have one, right? You ready for the video? We can play the video. And then right. we'll, we, when that's done, you can, I'll, you can, I'll answer any questions I have time left for. Uh, you can ask some questions. It's going to take me a second. Okay. So, we're, told, we're told some, some 
groups are pushing for that? How does it play into the mix? Um, I think it plays in the mix, but, you know, tolling, revenue, and uh, I don't know what the most recent number is, but it, it accounts for about 3 to 4 percent of the, of the, of the amount of, of revenue currently that's being derived for the program. So even if you doubled the amount of tolling, which seems like a pretty big stretch, you're not, so you're, you're still not, you're, you're not going to solve the entire problem. And I think there's lots of people who, lots of people out there who don't like tolls. The biggest group is truckers. <laughs> um, so I mean, they're 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 you know, w but I think it's part of the mix, and I think in certain places it's certainly one of the. It is part of the solution set. What about behavior influencing measures like congestion pricing and stuff that's specifically designed to get people to change the way they do things? Um, I think that's going to be something where we look at uh, when you're talking about urban areas. That's going to be some of what we're probably going to have to take a look at. I mean, they tried that in New York a number of years ago, and it failed. You know, the, the, this is during the Bush administration. They were they were given a grant to try and figure this out, and the state legislator, legislature, I think it was state legislature or the city, shot them down for that, and they said we're not doing that. Although you've seen other, you asked me where other, you know, Singapore I think has congestion pricing. London, right? London has congestion pricing. It works, <coughs> meaning. It works in the sense that you're not driving downtown at nine o'clock, <laughs> right? Or whatever, whatever their timing is, right? If it if it would cost you twenty dollars to cross the Fourteenth Street Bridge every day, you might find a different way. You might take the metro. You might, you know, whatever it might be. So, it it does it that has a behavioral effect. So, is there another question from anybody who has not yet asked a question in this <laughs> session? Uh, I did ask her a question before. Anybody else who has not asked a question? Okay, Clarice. So um, you did mention that one of the biggest challenges in getting more funding is that people just don't want to pay more. But it has to be, I think, more complicated than that in terms of the political side of it, meaning Congress members. What else can you tell us about the political hurdles to try to get more funding? Well, I mean, I think I think because there's not a hue and cry from the American people to raise their gas tax, right? I mean, it's so so with, with because we're short on that. Not that I thought we would ever get. You know, there's not going to be a demonstration here to say raise our gas tax, right? That's not. We probably won't have that. Um, I I think therefore members of Congress are automatically leery because their constituents aren't calling for it, right? But so it becomes a leadership issue for them to actually say, "Hey, you know, we got this problem. We have, there's a solution. We're going to solve the problem." Um, so I think that that probably is the is the largest hurdle, is that they they're not seeing a wide level of support back home for for these kinds of things. I will say, Pennsylvania raised their gas tax this year. Um, I was told I'm not, I'm, you know, so this is anecdotal. No state legislator lost their election due to raising the gas tax. The governor didn't do so great, but that's a whole different story, right? I don't, th boy, you know, um, and, and, and I don't think anyone gave him a hard time for that. He had other issues. But he um, on the campaign trail saying the gas prices were lower. Right, right, right. So, I mean, so I think that, that, and there's other instances where states have raised their gas tax where it has not had a negative effect on the, the, the legislators, but they're all afraid that it will. I think, and so I think that that becomes part of the problem for, for that solution. And again, I think from our perspective, it's got to be part of a larger larger package, if you will. No one's going to do an up or down vote on raising the gas tax. I don't, I'm not sure that we'd want that either, because I'm not that I'm not sure how that would roll. I don't think that would be a, be an interesting test, but I'm not sure that I want to take that test. All right, Raina. So not yet. Um, I am here to tell you to buck up, America, if you're one of the few Americans who still has a buck, because it's time for <laughs> tiny triumphs. <laughs> The American Society of Civil Engineers recently released their quadrennial report card and, for the first time in 15 years, we've improved our grade. In 2009, they gave the country's infrastructure a D, but this year, we've rocketed all the way up to D+. <laughs> <laughs> We are climbing the ladder. <laughs> By the way, do not climb that ladder. It is a death trap. <laughs> Folks, this report, which gives a comprehensive assessment of our nation's infrastructure, was released in March, but I just got it 
because the delivery truck spent four days stuck in a pothole. <laughs> Be proud, nation, because we have boosted our grade in all 16 infrastructure subjects, except for 10 of them. <laughs> for more, we turn to the first name in crumbling, CNN. Jim? Six categories saw improvements. Bridges, rail, roads, drinking water, solid waste, and wastewater. Solid waste earned the highest grade on the report, a B minus. Go solid waste. <laughs> yes. Yes. Go solid waste. Speaking of which, Tucker Carlson is the new host of Fox and Friends Weekend. Go Tucker. According to the report, we can now proudly say that only 25% of our nation's bridges are structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. That's right, there's a three in four chance that if you drive across a bridge, you will make it to the other side. <laughs> and America can hold its head high, knowing that when it comes to our nation's levees, 8% are in acceptable condition. Of the remaining levees, 22% are unacceptable, 42% are constructed of old marshmallow peas, <laughs> and 28% don't want to work, they just want to bang on the drum all day. Mason, I believe this inspiring D-plus is a grade we can all be proud of. In fact, I believe we should hang this report card somewhere high where everyone can see it, but not a bridge. <laughs> They may not be able to handle the load. <laughs> All right, before we wrap up, I think Sandy has a couple of uh, oh, tips on this. Just a couple of uh, reporting tips. Thank you, Brian. That was You're a welcome. terrific presentation. And ASAE, of course, is chock full of data that you can use. Um, the um, Transportation for America, which is an interest group, they use DOT data and they slice it by zip code for deficient bridges. So that's a good place to look at. And if you're interested in the background on the federal uh, gas tax, the Congressional Research Service, Service has done several reports on that. Uh, it started out as a penny and has gone up to 18.4 and hasn't moved in two decades. Yeah. And everybody, the, the CRS reports, which are technically only for Congress, there's a website called opencrs.org or .gov, but a lot of their reports end up on OpenCRS, so they're accessible. Um, and you also can often get them from congressional offices. And so forth. Um, we're technically out of time, but does anybody have one last question? Uh, or are you all very eager for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say thank you. I would say for those of you who want to do stories on this stuff, um, it's fine to talk to me. <clears throat> we have a lot of smart engineers who can explain things in English. <laughs> um, one of our jobs is for, for the folks that we have, especially when it comes to some of these complex topics, that, that we work with them to make sure that they can explain it so that all of us can understand it. One of their jobs is if I can understand it, then hopefully you can understand it. So that's, uh, um, we, we certainly will make them available to you and, and happy to, to work with any of you to, to tell the story of infrastructure. Great. Brian, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. We have for you uh, Evelyn oh, Wyatt, the studio. Thanks. This is our brand new studio.